Hello and welcome to yet another of the eBiology Teacher Podcasts. I'm Mr. Doc and today we're talking about active transport. Active transport. Now, the last video lecture that we did was on passive transport, so we really need to be able to distinguish the difference between the two. Uh, and we'll get into that in short order. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but also, we need to describe the different types of active transport. We've already talked about the different types of passive transport. Finally, we need to examine why active transport is important and be able to understand what types of organisms undergo those different processes. Now, if you need to copy these objectives down, go ahead and press pause. Otherwise, we're going to keep going. Hello. Uh, good to see you again. Now, ultimately, what we need to distinguish here, at least, at least what we need to come in common contact is, is that cells need to be able to move things from the outside to the inside and from the inside to the outside, meaning that sometimes there's things on the outside uh, that the cell needs in order to survive. Uh, and sometimes they can't just come in on their own. Sometimes they have to be brought in, which would require energy. Other things can move on their own through the process of osmosis or diffusion, which is a passive process. Now, as a quick reminder, let's take a look at what osmosis really is. All right. Diffusion is the net movement of molecules down a concentration gradient. This process allows small molecules, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, to cross the plasma membrane. Most polar molecules, such as sugars and proteins, cannot freely cross this lipid membrane. Although water molecules are polar, they are small enough to pass through the membrane freely. This special case of diffusion that involves the movement of water molecules across a membrane is called osmosis. If a molecule such as urea is added to one side of a membrane, it will not be able to diffuse across the membrane because it is both large and polar. Because of its polar nature, it will interact with other polar molecules such as the water. This interaction reduces the number of free water molecules on the right-hand side. With fewer free water molecules on the right-hand side, there is now a net movement of water molecules down their concentration gradient to the side with the urea molecules. Because more water molecules are moving into this area than are leaving, the water level on the right side will rise. If the osmotic concentrations of two solutions are equal, the solutions are isotonic. However, when the solutions have unequal osmotic concentrations, the solution with the higher concentration of solutes is hypertonic, and the solution with the lower concentration of solutes is hypotonic. Now, that was a simple review of what we've already talked about, and if you need any more clarification on that, you're welcome to go back and, and visit that, uh, that video lecture. Um, now, there was another type of passive transport that we talked about called facilitated diffusion, and I think that's a good jumping off point to getting into active transport. Now, facilitated diffusion is very similar to active transport in that it, substances can't just go across the membrane willy-nilly. They need some way of getting across. But facilitated diffusion still doesn't use energy. It uses an open door that allows only certain things through due to their shape. So let's take a look at what facilitated diffusion, once again, facilitated diffusion is still passive transport. Let's take a look at what facilitated diffusion does. In the process known as facilitated diffusion, a special carrier protein with a central channel acts as a selective corridor which helps molecules move across the membrane. These special carrier molecules that form the protein channel bind only to a specific molecule such as a particular sugar or amino acid. Once the molecule binds to the carrier protein, this protein helps or facilitates the diffusion process by changing shape and moving the molecule down its concentration gradient through the membrane into the cell where it is released. Facilitated diffusion is similar to simple diffusion in that both involve movement of molecules down their concentration gradient and this movement is carried out without any input of energy. However, in facilitated diffusion, the movement of molecules will only take place if it is facilitated or helped by a special protein carrier in the membrane. 
Facilitated diffusion can occur in either direction depending on the concentration gradient. If there is a higher concentration of the particular molecule inside the cell, the same carrier protein would then transport the molecules out of the cell. The consistent theme between those two concepts is that things are moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration. In other words, they're moving in the direction of the concentration gradient. But there are times where two of these things may not line up. Number one, what if something needs to move against the gradient? There are times when we need something more, like, more concentrated on the inside than outside or vice versa. So that means we have to move things against the gradient. Another thing that can happen is what if the thing that we're looking at is just too big? Or we got to figure out a way to get it in without breaching the membrane and letting other stuff in. <clears throat> That's where active transport comes in. Both of those situations are going to require the use of energy. So let's talk about active transport. Once again, there are times where cells must move things from an area of low concentration to high concentration. Or they must move something that's too big. This means that the cell has to do work. It's got to fight that natural concentration gradient. Active transport is the transport of materials into or out of a cell by way of using energy to make it happen. Now this is much different than passive transport in that passive transport will happen on its own. We don't need any additional energy because what drives the movement is the simple difference in concentration. If you remember our last lecture, I used the car going down a hill as an example of passive transport. Active transport was the example of the car going up the hill. A car going down a hill, once it starts, it's going to go on its own. It's just going to, you're not going to have to even push the gas. But to go up the hill, you are going to have to put it into gear and drive that car or burn that gas to get up the top of the hill. Now, there are several different kinds of active transport, the first of which is what we call ion pumps. <clears throat> Now, cell membranes, some of them have carrier proteins that act as doors to let materials in and out. Some materials, like potassium and sodium ions, need to have differences in concentration, meaning we need a higher concentration of potassium inside our cells, but we want a lower concentration of sodium inside our cells, which means we need a larger concentration on the outside. This is the use of ion pumps. Ion pumps use energy produced by ATP, which we'll get into in another unit, to force sodium out of the cell while taking in potassium, all the while working against the concentration gradient. Once again, this is really, really important. Ions are going to be moving against the gradient which means that sodium is already going to be higher outside than in, but the cell is still going to be moving it outside where it's higher. Potassium is going to have a higher concentration inside the cell, but we're going to force even more potassium in, so we are going against the concentration gradient. Again, we're going uphill. We're fighting the natural flow here. Plus, we're dealing with polar molecules, or, or more specifically, we're dealing with charged ions trying to go across a membrane. Let's take a look at what a sodium-potassium pump might look like. The sodium-potassium pump is an active transport mechanism. Three sodium ions bind to the protein channel, and an ATP provides the energy to change the shape of the channel that in turn drives the ions through the channel. One phosphate group from the ATP remains bound with the channel. The sodium ions are released on the other side of the membrane outside of the cell, and the new shape of the channel has a high affinity for potassium ions, and two of these ions now bind to the channel. This binding again causes a change in the shape of the protein channel, and this conformational change releases the phosphate group on the cytoplasm side. This release allows the channel to revert to its original shape, and as a result, the potassium ions are released inside the cell. In its original shape, the channel has a high affinity for sodium ions, and when these ions bind again, they initiate another cycle. 
The important characteristic of this pump is that both sodium and potassium ions are moving from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. That is to say, each ion is moving against its concentration gradient. This type of movement can only be achieved by the constant expenditure of ATP energy. Now, I want to make sure you understand something. If you look at that um, animation, you're going to tell that shape has a lot to do with it. As a matter of fact, the narrator even said that when the sodium is attached to the protein, the protein changes shape. And again, we already know that shape has a lot to do with function. It has a lot to do with how things are going to work and what they're going to do. <clears throat> and then, of course, when it does change shape and those potassiums came in, we saw another change in shape. We saw another functional change because we reverted back to its original shape, thus reverting back to its original function. Keep in mind, he also said we're talking about a concentration gradient difference. We're going against the gradient. And that ATP molecule that you saw that initiated that, that opening of the protein is where the energy is coming from. And we'll talk about how ATP is being produced in our next unit. So let's go back to our notes here and let's talk about another thing that we can do. Now, ion pumps are dealing with things that wouldn't naturally cross the membrane because of their charge. They are small enough to cross the membrane, but their charge prevents them from doing so. So sodium potassium pumps help us out there. And one thing, just to, just to go back real quick, sodium potassium pumps are critical in human physiology because that's how nerve impulses work. Basically, we have to maintain those concentration differences because when we send a nerve impulse, those concentrations differ going down the line. So that's how a nerve impulse moves across the system. So, so they are critical. They're absolutely critical uh, <clears throat> to, to biology. They're also critical uh, in what we call cellular respiration, which is how our bodies convert glucose into usable energy, namely ATP. So both of those uh, situations are, are obviously critical for our survival. Thus, uh, protein, uh, pump, or sorry, uh, ion pumps are super critical. Now, um, we're going to take a look uh, at vesicles. Now, vesicles uh, occur when something is too big to fit through the molecule uh, or to, through the membrane itself. Um, sometimes carrier proteins can act as doors, but even the carrier proteins can be too small for some molecules to fit. Thus, cells are able to use their own membranes to create what we call vacuoles, and in some cases vesicles, which are basically just little membrane-bound sacs that can be sucked into the cell. But really what's happening is the cell converts its outer membrane into an inner membrane. And this is when an understanding of that whole um, fluid mosaic model that we've talked about already really comes into play. You see, all the little parts <clears throat> of the membrane are interchangeable. So if we have a solid membrane here, and then the membrane starts to fold in on itself and attach like that, the membrane that is folded on the inside can make its own little bubble, while the outer portions that are coming together like this reconnect and never let the membrane open all the way. So if we have a solid membrane here and then the membrane folds together and reconnects like that, what we see is that the cell can actually take a, almost a mouthful of stuff from the outside, bring it on the inside, but never fully expose itself. And we're going to see how that works right now. <clears throat> Namely, we use a process called endocytosis. Now, if we look at what those words mean, the word endo means inside, cyto is cell, and cis really indicates a process. So it's a process of getting stuff into a cell. And basically what we see here in this diagram is that this substance is being taken in and the cell membrane is closing in on itself, thus creating this little pouch or vesicle. And then that's going to pop off and we're going to have this little vesicle or vacuole inside the cell. <clears throat> Endocytosis is the process of taking stuff into the cell by folding in on itself and making these little pockets. Now, exocytosis is a similar process, except that it's opposite. 
Exocytosis is when one of those bubbles or vacuoles, vesicles that we've made, has stuff in it that we want to get rid of. Then it's going to travel to the membrane. It's going to attach, and then when it does, it's going to open up, and it's going to spit out all that stuff that was in there, all that digested crud that we don't want anymore, that stuff we want outside of the cell. And you'll notice that when it does that, that vesicle now just joins with the outer membrane and becomes part of the outer membrane, thus making it fluid, making it able to change. That's why fluid mosaic model is such a, re, a real like, perfect example of, of what we talk about. So endocytosis is where we take stuff in and it kind of sucks it in, right? Exocytosis is kind of where it, it spits out, okay? Uh, keep in mind, though, at that process, nothing is actually opening up to the outside. Now, there is an animation I want to show you that I think is a pretty good job of showing you how this works. All right, so let's take a look at endo and exocytosis. The substances taken in by single-celled organisms are often particles or large polar molecules that cannot cross the hydrophobic plasma membrane. Many single-celled eukaryotes employ endocytosis to ingest such food particles. In this process, the plasma membrane extends outward and surrounds the food particle. Cells use three major types of endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. If the material the cell takes in is particulate, such as a bacterium or a fragment of organic matter, the process is called phagocytosis. If the material the cell takes in is liquid, it is called pinocytosis. Specific molecules, such as low-density lipoproteins, LDL, are often transported into eukaryotic cells through receptor-mediated endocytosis. Molecules to be transported first bind to specific receptors on the plasma membrane. The interior portion of the receptor protein is embedded in the membrane. The protein clathrin coats the inside of the membrane in the area of the pit. When an appropriate collection of molecules gathers in the coated pit, the pit deepens and seals off to form a coated vesicle which carries the molecules into the cell. Exocytosis is the reverse of endocytosis. This process results in the discharge of material from vesicles at the cell surface to the outside of the cell. Now let's take a look at what's really happening here, okay? If we look at this, let's assume that those little uh, yellowish-orange particles are coming in. If they were to do that, right, they're going to form that little pouch. This would be endocytosis as I'm bringing it in. And I want you to notice how, look how that membrane just comes together and forms this little vesicle. And that vesicle just goes boop and pops in. Now we've got this little membrane-bound sac inside our cell. But notice how the membrane was never open to the outside world, right? That's a homeostatic protection. But when we want that stuff out, the opposite is true. All we have to do is take that little vesicle, take it to the edge, and then once it attaches, that membrane is going to come a part of the outer membrane, the cell membrane, and it's going to squirt that stuff out, and it's gone. All right, that's endo and exocytosis. But this video has also pointed out to us that these things aren't just one kind. It's not a one-trick pony, okay? There are a lot of different ways to do this. For example, an amoeba undergoes what we call phagocytosis. So let's talk about that here uh, in just a second, right? Phagocytosis is when a... Uh, organism basically engulfs something. It basically makes these extensions, right, that go out and grab whatever it is that it wants, and then it closes it in. So this will become the little vesicle or little vacuole that we were talking about. Penocytosis, once again, is similar to endocytosis, except instead of it being a solid particulate matter, um, it is a... Um, it's, it's a fluid. It's so, so penocytosis is really when a cell brings in uh, large amounts of fluid. Phagocytosis is when it brings in large uh, amounts or large uh, substances. Now, there are two advantages to this. Number one, in, phagocyto in phagocytosis, we can bring in either a large molecule that would never be able to fit, 
or we can bring a whole bunch of smaller molecules that would take us a long time to get into the cell, right? So we can basically buy in bulk, okay? Uh, phagocytosis is kind of like going to Costco. You just get it all at once, right? Um, and pinocytosis is the same way. We can get, instead of letting stuff flow slowly through the osmotic pressure, what we can actually do is just get a bolus of it, a whole bunch of it at one time, and that helps us out. Now, I'm going to do something real quick. I should have planned this out a little better, but uh, hopefully it won't come back to bite me. We are going to go to YouTube, and we're going to get a video. I want to show you. Uh, see if I can learn how to type. Um, I'm going to show you an amoeba undergoing phagocytosis. All right. I believe this is the video. Let's hope it's appropriate. All righty. Hold on one second. Cinematic. This is going to be good. I really should have pulled this up and watched it earlier. Oh, come on. Here we go. There we go. What you're actually looking at here uh, is an amoeba. This thing right here is an amoeba. Okay. And what it's going to try to do is it's going to try to eat something. Okay. So what it's doing is going to grab something and it's going to suck it into the organism itself. It's like watching a horror movie. <gasps> oh, what's happening? No, don't, don't go in there. Don't go in there. Ah! Okay, now watch what's happened. Now it's got this little paramecium is what it looks like it's trying to eat here. And it's making these large extensions, what they call pseudopods, right? And basically it's going to engulf this guy. So this guy is starting to get creeped on, right? Ooh, this is scary. It's like Halloween type stuff. Uh-oh, Paramecium can't get out. It's trapped. What's it going to do? Well, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's in a little trouble. It's, it, this, this does not bode well for the Paramecium. The music makes it just hideously scary. So this guy is actually, right here, this guy's the food. right here the membrane's starting to attach right once those membranes attach this whole thing becomes a vesicle Sorry. All right. So you get the idea that phagocytosis is kind of bringing this stuff in, right? You have cells in your body that do that, namely white blood cells. They will go to, say, bacteria, right, that are trying to, to make you sick. And they'll go, I'm going to get you. And they grab them. They pull them in. They destroy the bacteria. So the bacteria stop making you sick. Now, the question is, how do they know what to get? If you remember back in the video that we saw earlier, we have... Uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis. There are little proteins on that fluid mosaic model on the outside of the membrane that recognize chemical components. And they go, when they, when they come in contact with those, they go, oh, that's not supposed to be here. Oh, I'm going to eat you, right? So those little receptor proteins on the outside are what really give us the clues that that thing needs to be uh, taken in and destroyed. And in other terms, uh, sometimes we notice things you, what, that are food sources, and when we chemically recognize them, that's when the cell goes into its uh, endocytosis mode. And remember, phagocytosis and pinocytosis are both types of uh, uh, endocytosis. And one other quick note uh, while we're talking about that. Um, exocytosis would occur in that same vacuole, that vacuole that we saw the, the amoeba in, when that amoeba is digested, and that's exactly what's going to happen, by the way, that little vacuole is going to get fed enzymes and acids that will destroy it, then that amoeba is just going to use all that energy for itself. That amoeba is going to use all that energy for itself. But there's going to be waste left over. So then what's going to happen is that vacuole is going to touch the edge and it's going to spit out all the waste through the process of exocytosis. Pretty cool stuff. At least I think so. All right. So let's take it back to our objectives. 
First off, the main difference between active and passive transport is simply the use of energy. Active transport requires energy, passive transport does not. Keep in mind also that passive transport always happens, always happens in the direction of the concentration gradient. In other words, from an area at high concentration to low concentration. Active transport can happen against the gradient from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration or if the molecule is simply too big to move across the membrane. The difference between ion pumps and facilitated diffusion are very simple. They both require a protein. They both require a protein that acts sort of like a door. They're also both very specialized in that they only work with particular molecules. Their shape has to match their function, not unlike an enzyme. The major difference is facilitated diffusion acts like a door that only opens for one thing and doesn't require energy. Ion pumps can pump things in and out, but they do require the use of energy. So facilitated diffusion is a type of passive transport that requires a carrier protein. Ion pumps is a type of active transport that requires a carrier protein. All right. Now, the biological importance of active transport. Once again, we've given a couple examples of that. If our cells need a large portion of something inside a cell that would not fit across the membrane, then we need active transport. Or if our cells need something in a difference of concentration, meaning we don't want equilibrium, we want a higher concentration inside rather than outside, kind of like sodium potassium, active transport would be crucial. We don't have nerve impulses without ion pumps. Okay? We don't convert glucose into ATP without ion pumps. They are essential to life happening, okay? And finally, endocytosis, penocytosis, phagocytosis, and exocytosis. Endocytosis covers peno and phagocytosis. So peno and phagocytosis are both types of endocytosis. Those are processes by which we take stuff in. Phagocytosis specifically being uh, large particulate matter or solid matter, and then penocytosis being uh, fluid. We're taking in large amounts of fluid. Finally, exocytosis is basically taking stuff from inside the, uh, the cell and spitting it out. Keeping in mind, sometimes that stuff is too big to fit through the membrane on its own, so the only way to excrete it is for the cell to make a little vacuole, stick it to the side, and spit it out. Okay? That's your lecture on active transport. I hope it's helped. Feel free to watch it as many times as you want. It's certainly to win an Oscar. Um, <clears throat> And uh, make sure that if you have any questions, you contact me as soon as possible. It's absolutely been my pleasure, and I hope that you don't have nightmares of being eaten by an amoeba, though I'd be lying if I told you that I haven't. I'm a little afraid of amoebas, so have a good day.